Hey everyone, welcome to Talk Python to Me. It's great to have you all here. Ivrit, Brant, Pablo, and Mark. It's going to be super fun to speak with all of you about Python 3.11. So, you know, before we get into it, I guess just real quickly, uh, I know some of you have been on the show before, but not all of you. So let's just do a quick introduction about who you are and how you ended up here on the show. Huh. Ivrit, you want to start first? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Irit Kotriel. I'm a Python core dev. And um, I, earlier in the week, we streamed the release of uh, Python 3.11. And on the back of that, uh, Michael just invited us all here for chat. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, that was a great live stream. And we'll, we'll talk about that for sure in a second. But uh, Brant, welcome back. Hello, my name is Brant Booker. Uh, I have been a core dev for like two years now, and I work with Mark and Irit on the Faster C Python team at Microsoft. Right on. And Pablo. I was on the show like a month ago. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about uh, the Faster Python stuff, which we'll, we'll touch on again. Hello, I'm Pablo Galindo. I'm the infamous release manager. Um, I release <laughs> Python 3.11, and uh, you can... Uh, redirect all your complaints to to my email address no please don't do that um so i'm a c python core dev um i'm also serving um this year and the last year on the python steering council um and uh, i also release uh, i'm the release manager for python 310 and uh, 311 which is now the best version of python download it today um apart from that i do a bunch of parser stuff but now we are not talking about that here <laughs> yeah fantastic well welcome mark welcome back Hi there. Uh, I'm Mark Shannon. I'm the tech lead of the Faster C Python team. I work with Eric and Brandt, and I've been a core dev for some number of years, I don't recall. Yeah. You've been spending a couple of years working on this faster C Python thing, and uh, yeah. very excited to see some of the fruits of those labors um, you know, starting to show up and get in the hands of everyone with this release. Yeah, it's good to have the stuff out actually in public and in people's hands. It's it's really rewarding to know that stuff you're working on is actually used and used by a lot of people. Yeah, that's that is totally true. It's it's one thing to build software. I mean, just by itself and it's fun, but all of you, all of you are working on code that touches so many people. I mean, think about it. there's layers, right? One layer is how many people use Python. Many millions, millions. Does anyone know a reasonable estimate of this number? I, I think some. I don't remember who came with the number, but I think they were estimating like six million Python developers, uh, something like yeah. that. I mean, probably is is between zero and ten million. Let's say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a massive impact, but and also maybe nervousness about pushing code out to that group, but then. You know, those people will build software for others, right? If, if you're using Instagram or using YouTube or other things, right? It's also having massive knock-on effects there. So thanks for putting all this together. Thanks for improving the tools that we all get to use. So yeah, big news. The big news is that Python 3.11 is out. And as Irit had said, you all live streamed that release. So here we're all together. We're having an awesome chat about the features and the what people can do to take advantage of it and why they might care about new features and want to learn them. But there you, you did a little bit of that. But also, Pablo, you actually step by step did the release of CPython mostly live, right? Yeah, I did. Uh, it was uh, except the boring part. <laughs> Um, this is something that I started uh, last year because apparently I didn't have enough things to worry <laughs> and I decided to make my life even more difficult. I'm an expert on that, um, quite proficient. I, I'm, I'm also an expert. I'm very bad at doing too many things. And yeah. You could be a release manager. It's the only requirement. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so, yeah, the idea is that the, the kind of releasing Python... It's a process that is quite complicated. It's also quite boring. So it's not like you know, you know, you need to be have a galaxy brain kind of thing to to do it. But it's just a lot of steps, and it's very easy to do it wrong. And it's very unglamorous. Uh, so I said, oh wow, uh, I'm sure people really would like to see a very unglamorous process happening in life. And then I said, Let, let's do it. 
And I asked around and I was surprised about how many people enjoy Anglamorous processes. And then I did the release of Python 3.10 Beta 1, um, which turned out to be much funnier than I thought because we just broke GitHub. That happened live. Um, yes. Uh, I, I, I also was that added when that you imported my... all the you imported all the issues and, and did that migration or was that separate? I, you will think that that is a good candidate, but no, that was not the thing that broke GitHub. We renamed a master to main on the CPython repo and the whole GitHub platform was down. What about that? Huh? It, wow. Yeah, you can see those Ruby workers really struggling with the renaming, <laughs> yeah? all those forks. I think we were the, I don't know, someone at GitHub may confirm this, but I think we were the first big project to do the renaming and Something went wrong. And it was very funny because I, I literally said, how funny will it be if now I get a 500? Um, there you go, a 500 on the screen. Yeah, yeah, it's recorded. There is someone actually recorded that clip. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so, so I said, wow, man, this has been a, such exciting thing that I can break such a big project. Let's do it more. So I decided also to stream the, um, the 310 release itself. And I said, well, technically the release, the final release is, is, is even more boring and longer. So, so that is actually probably not going to be even like, you know, something that someone wants to see. So I said, okay, let's, let's not do it alone. So I invited a bunch of friends and core developers so they can actually talk about, you know, the, the things that they worked on the Python 3.10 release and uh, Brand and Edith were, were there uh, so that they can, uh, they can probably tell you, um, how they found out, but like apparently it was something that a lot of people enjoy uh, because you know it's not only an opportunity to see how the sausage is made, um, because you know I was just explaining all the commands and all the faces and whatnot. But like when something became very boring, then you know like uh, Brand and Edith were there to save the day and explain the cool things they they work on. Um, so you know, which is a very good opportunity because you know when is the last time you could hear the the author of the feature that you love talk about the feature that you love? That is fantastic, and it happened. Right. And, um, not it happened only also. did it happen, not only did it happen, but as they were explaining the feature that they built, the action of it being delivered to the entire world was right. Right, happening, right? it was like all coming together in a pretty awesome way. Exactly, and I could only do just to be fair, also, and and you know, credit where credit is due. Um, I could only do that because the the first time I did the the live thing, uh, I was also doing all the, you know, pushing all the buttons and at the same time doing all the video stuff with, <coughs> sorry, with um, I don't know what is the software to do the stream, but like whatever. Um, um, and the second time I. Uh, we use the the help of the Python Discord team, which are fantastic, and they they help us a, a lot. They they um, have this fantastic UI where you know all the questions that were asked on the chat they are shown on the screen, and we couldn't use it. Do you know why? Because Facebook oh, no. or now Meta decided to break DNS globally. What an incredible fit! Huh? <laughs> Just in time. So uh, what I'm learning add. is, if we need some sort of like big cloud global outage. You all just need to just call Pablo. Sort of yes, just, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> just, just, just okay. hire me today. Um, so yes, that, that uh, now we were like two big outages on on Python release. The you know, <laughs> there is only a line that passes through two points, but I you know it's, it was a it was a it's a good uh, good statistic already. So we said, what can I, what else can we break? So there you go. We decided to do the three eleven release again. Uh, then Mark was there as well. Um, which increases the probability of things being broken by a lot. <laughs> Sorry, Mark, I had to do the joke. Um, and um, he also fixes them, so you know it's fine. Um, and nothing broke. Uh, so, so kudos to Mark. Uh, everything thanks to to that. And um, and we did the release. So, so we did the same thing. We explained the whole thing, uh, so people could see uh, from the authors themselves, like why all the switches are very cool. And I did the non-boring parts of the release. Um, and then we have a bit of uh, some dramas uh, in backstage because my Yubi key that I used to sign release broke um, and I freak out quite a lot. But uh, I thankfully have a backup Yubi key. So nobody wow. had, yeah, yeah. So crazy, eh? Because if I didn't have that, then I will have to stop the whole thing. But we didn't have to do that. Um, it was just backstage. So yeah, quite quite exciting. Nothing broke except my Yubi key. I suppose that's the third thing that broke. It's not a global, you know, <laughs> software, but, but I still mourn it. Is here. Um, yeah. 
it served you well, but now it's yeah, it yeah. gave its life for Python 3.11. Too much power. Like 3.11 was too powerful. <laughs> it just broke it. <laughs> this is a dangerous job that you got. It, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but you've handed it off, right? This is your last time, last main uh, release. Yeah, yeah. I need to do the security and bug fix releases, but I don't need to do the 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 ones that you know you need to chase people down and ask for like cherry picking. And there was a bunch of things of the release that were quite boring. Like um, normally we uh, release the previous version, like that before the final version. There is something called the release candidate, which is you know like the last version that people need to try out before we do the final release. Mm -hmm. And ideally, that is the last version that we publish. Um, Normally, it means that you publish from that commit, uh, but, but this was not the case. This is the first release that had 130 something commits on top of that, and that I had to painstakingly cherry pick, um, and it was not fun. But I did that before the release, it's like two hours because yeah. you need to fix conflicts and things like that. Yeah, very, very boring. But yeah, I I started the the, the stream with that already done, so so it was fine. Yeah, fantastic. Now, before we get into all the features, and I want to um, maybe just talk a little bit about some of the, the tools for actually doing the, the release, you know, maybe re start with you, is um, just what, what does 3.11 mean for you all? Like, getting this out, what does that mean for the Python community from your perspective? Well, 3.11 is, is a huge release. There's a lot packed into it compared to the last few releases. Um, it, 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 there's, there, there are new features, there's the performance work, it's, it's just massive changes internally. It, it's just a, a huge release. And personally, I started working on, you know, exception groups about two years ago. So for me, this is, it, it, it almost feels like finishing another PhD or something. It's, it's a massive kind of effort and here it is, it's done. It's it's yeah. it, was, it was a big day Monday. I had a bottle of champagne ready for the stream. It was a celebration. Yeah, it was. Brent, how about you? Um, I, I'm really excited about 3.11 because I think there's something for everyone in, in there. You know, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't want their code to run faster and who doesn't want better error messages. And then you have all these other improvements on top of that. Um, it's really nice to see both these like new features, uh, which are something that we get in most Python releases, but also just the stuff that's there for everyone else who just wants to upgrade Python and just have a better experience all around. Yeah, yeah, uh, I totally agree with that. It's, it's cool to see people's responses to that too, because responses have been really, really positive, which is another thing that I liked about the live stream, because we did, you know, live Q&A and we had the chat and everything going on. And you, you, when you're staring at the same code base for like a year, um, you're like, okay, I'm pretty sure that what we've done here is really, really cool, but you know, like, is it actually as awesome as I think it is, you know, or have I just been staring at it for too long and, yeah, and then yeah. <laughs> release it to the world and people are even more stoked about it than you are. And that's a really good feeling. Yeah, it is awesome. Mark. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I started on trying to get Python faster 15 years ago, I guess early PhD. Yeah. With hot pie, right? Yeah, yes, yeah. so that was a long time. This has been a long time coming. So, yeah, it's good. It's it's amazing to have it actually out and starting to see the speed ups. And obviously, we're we're keeping working on it. So it's uh, it's pretty good. Yeah, fantastic. I, I you must be really proud because, like you said, you have been proposing this for a really long time. You've had a lot of ideas, and finally, you've got a a group of people working on it. And you written Brent. You are all on the same team with Mark and Guido. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And just making making legitimate serious progress here. So it's you must be really proud to just sort of see this actually go out the door. Yes, definitely. Yeah. For Especially me. Especially in the yeah, Python too. Um it's it's really nice um that we're able to, you know, deliver this for everyone. Yeah. For me. I see basically three things like kind of like you said, Brent, I see that obviously there's these new features like exception groups, which are lovely and make the language better, but it also gets friendlier for, especially for beginners, but for everyone, of course, with the better error messages and um, better reporting and tracebacks and it gets faster. And so 
I mean, it and all the axes that seem to matter. It's it's really fantastic. Okay, so let's let's dive in. I just you know, um, Pablo, let's go back just a little bit to the the release process because people got to watch you do it, but they didn't actually you know see exactly what you're typing on your screen the whole time. It was more of about a like an event of it. Sometimes your screen was up, sometimes it wasn't. But there's an official pep that talks about like here's the recipe for doing this, right? That is correct. It's PEP 101, um, doing Python releases. Uh, and that is a curious document. It's a peculiar document that talks about how it's done, but it's like, uh, it's kind of weird. Um, so the, the document is up to date. Like you can actually, you know, search PEP 101 and it will show you the, the thing. So the, the, what, what is there is the actual process. It's just, it also contains these weird sentences. Like if you search for it, there is a bunch of places that says stop, 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 stop. Um, quite funny. And that was, uh, if I recall correctly, Larry Hastings. <laughs> <laughs> that he, he, he wrote those things. Uh, and the idea is that he could search for those uh, places and he knows that at that stage he, he needs to wait for something to happen or something. And we left it there. So he's, he, there's a bunch of like weird uh, artifacts. And... Um, you know, it's full of bullet points because you, at some stages you need to do some things and some others and things like that. And, you know, it says, okay, if you're running a beta release, then you need to do this bunch of things. And if you're running an alpha release, you need to do this bunch of things. And I have done the, <laughs> I have done a state machine that goes through the whole thing because, like, if you actually write this down, it's quite, is it, you know, the, the how is this called the maintainability index of this process is insane it just, <laughs> just rejects your thing it just don't, don't yeah, merge yeah. it um right and i said like yeah i'm not doing this reading so one thing i did um which is the thing that i was using at the at the stream uh, my first work as a release manager is to say i'm not going to do this by hand um and that is the vision um and then i did this script that is on uh, github slash python slash release tools and it's a it's my attempt uh, attempt at automating this process as much as possible, um, which unfortunately uh, you know it still requires a bunch of manual steps because like that's life and things happen. But uh, it's quite automatic. Like at least things that are not like final releases, so so alphas and and release candidates, and now that we are in back fix releases, it mostly runs automatically, uh, except that you know in the final release everything fails because. You know, that's, that's, that's the final release for you. And then you need to fix things manually. Uh, so you, I think you saw me, uh, you know, executing a bunch of yeah. those, those fixes. At some point, I, I added a division by zero just to know that something was hit and that was seen on the screen. Because, like, <laughs> and people were like, division by zero? Why do you need that to release Python? And I'm like, I don't know. That's very complicated. Um, <laughs> I so could yes. have asserted false. Come on, anything would work here. No, no, we divide by zero. I'm a physicist, so that's what I do. Okay. Assert okay. false is for 50%. You, so you studied that. black holes, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, that's, you were looking for some sort of like in, infinite sort of thing. Exactly. That divide by zero. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too tired for today. Let's just collapse the universe uh, dividing by zero. Oh, but Python was too friendly. Instead of collapsing the universe, it saw me an exception. You know, quite nice. Uh, only in 311. No, no, I'm joking. Uh, anyway, so yes, yes, you can follow this pep and you know, um, just, just, just uh, enjoy the whole process on its glory. Or you can see the, the script. Um, but yeah, it's quite verbose. You can see that it's very, it's lots of places when everything can go wrong and you can panic. Um, now we know one more. Uh, apparently, your Yubikey can break, so that's something that can happen as well. But like you know, uh, it's, it's quite annoying, and uh, that's the main job of the release manager: uh, go through this annoying process. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see that there are some parts in here. You should have a few more stops. I should say, stop, stop, stop. Make sure GitHub still works. Stop, stop, stop. Make sure Azure still works. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> yeah, don't cry. Don't cry at this stage. <laughs> Everyone's looking at you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the one thing that is not in this pub is that you also are in charge in theory of this extreme abstract mandate, which is that you are in charge of the stability of the release, whatever that means. Uh, that translates mostly on chasing people because they broke things. Um, and um, the, yeah. uh, another unfortunate event that we are trying to also fix a bit for the for the releases is that most people turn to the release manager to solve problems. So they say, hey, this person says that we should do X, while this other person says that we should do Y. 
we need someone to decide. Let's 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 reach to the release manager. But the release manager is this 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 guy on the corner, like he doesn't know shit. So I like you know, it's not the best he's not the best person to fetch it. But everybody was like, What do you think, Pablo? So we merge this and like, I don't know, man, this is some enum things. Like, I don't know about this. <laughs> I have no context whatsoever. Your your um, only concern is will it still build and ship? Exactly. Right? Like, like how? <laughs> I like yeah. What about these two thousand lines of code that sold this tiny bag? It's like well, maybe let's not merge that. Uh, but yeah, like we are trying to also like you know redirect all of this to the steering council, which also I am in the steering council, so apparently I'm not going to get rid of these questions. Um, I'm joking. I enjoy all these questions, but as a release manager, I don't. So I like the key here is that the release manager should not take unilateral decisions on the evolution of these things because like it's just the release manager. So the reason the Steam Council but is you are the one who delivers the code. You could kind of you could sneak a feature. In no, there. Come no, on. no, I don't. I don't decide important things. I just execute and chase people, and I'm this annoying guy that says you broke this, fix it. But like then, if there is some important decisions to be taken, you know, that's the Steam Council job, which is five people. Because you know, one person shouldn't decide these things. It's like, and this happens. Like sometimes I say, "Hey, there is this PR when people are asking, well, what should we do?" And then this is my opinion as the member of the steering council, and the other four members maybe they say, "Well, actually, that's not a good opinion." So what about this? And you know, we ended in a much better place because it was five people, five persons doing a decision instead of one. Uh, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so if people want to follow along with the process, they can check out PEP 101. Uh, let's see. Let's let's keep over here. You also talked about the Python build bot that people can check out, but I think maybe we want to jump into our first feature. There's, as Irit said, there's a ton of features and things in here, but there's also maybe some top level ones that'll be really important for a lot of folks and. You want to tell us about your work you mentioned before, the exception uh, groups sure. and exception sure, star? Yeah. Um, so, so this is kind of a major new feature that we added. And uh, the idea is that sometimes you have a situation where you did several things and maybe more than one of them raised an exception. And now you need to report that there was more than one error in whatever you did. And what you did could have been a bunch of asynchronous tasks, which is that that was the use case that motivated this whole thing but there are also kind of situations where you just iterate over a few things and 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 repeat them and accumulate exceptions and you want to kind of report all of them and uh the pep lists a bunch of examples of where this can happen so so the uh, people typically what they do is they'll take a list of exceptions wrap it in another exception multi-error some other yeah kind of wrapper and, and, and throw that, and then you have to catch it. And then you have to iterate over the list and, and look at the exceptions, but you don't have a method to handle the exceptions. Like you have try accept, like catch these, but not catch exceptions. Right, right. I've because in accept, you might have like accept socket error, or you might right. have accept, you know, um, like file not found type of thing. But if those both happen, neither of those would run in Python 3.10, right? Because it's some kind of weird wrapper and it's not a socket exception, it's not a file exception, but it kind of contains both. And so in a sense, right. both and, run? I don't know. And, and then if you, if you catch the wrapper and you do something with some of the exceptions, you better not forget to raise the rest because you're not handling them. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of problems when you try to work around this and like, like what happened with uh, Trio. So Trio had multi-error would raise this wrapper and, and it, it was uh, it, it had to do a lot of complicated acrobatics just to have some error handling. So so the motivation was, yeah, we have task groups in, in Python 3.11, which are kind of like trio uh, nurseries, kind of a structured uh, collection of asynchronous tasks. And task groups were on the cards, they started uh, like Yuri Sullivanov, who was kind of maintaining AsyncIO in the beginning, he wrote a lot of AsyncIO. He wanted to add task groups since 2017, 2018, something like that. And what was holding it up was error handling. Like there was no good way to handle errors. So now we have accept star, which is which generalizes accept and works with groups. So you can say accept star. Um, socket error and, and then it will just extract all the socket errors from the group and give you those and automatically re-raise everything else so that's that's basically the idea um, okay so this is 
Yeah. This is pretty interesting. We have try, do your thing, and then accept star. Um, you know, one error type, accept star, another error type, accept star, a set of errors potentially. So what happens if I'm in this situation and say the first error type and maybe something from the third error error catch clause is thrown in one of these task group, uh, uh, exception groups? So each exception in the group will be handled by at most one of the clauses. So the first clause that matches its type will consume it and each clause ex executes once so if there are more than one errors of that type then what gets uh, kind of bound in in the accept star foo error as e what gets bound to e is a group of foo errors so okay. you, you get all the foo errors in a group execute that clause and then move on to the next clause with whatever is not handled yet interesting so it might run two of the clauses and exactly. whereas in traditional exception handling, it goes from top to bottom and it looks for an inheritance type of match. And the first one that matches, that's it. But in this case with the star, you could get multiple ones. I guess the, the star to me, when I look at this, the star is reminiscent of args star where you have unpacking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it's not exactly unpacking, but it was, it was kind of the intention to make it look a bit like unpacking. Nice. Yeah, this looks like a, a really cool feature. You know, um, you talked about the task groups and, and trio and, and those things. Um, so when I saw this, concurrent errors obviously come to mind because if I try to both write something to a database and call a web service asynchronously and I start both of those and they both crash or, you know, multiple ones crash, which error do you want? The database error or do you want the API error? You probably want to know about both of them, right? So that, that's a real natural reason to bring these together. Um, but maybe you'd also list out some of the other reasons that you might run into this. Maybe right. give people so, some other ideas. So, so the example of in the socket model, we have the create connection function. And that function, uh, I was showing it in the stream, it iterates over all the configurations that you could try to connect with and then depending on what's going on on the other side hopefully one of them works but if none of them work you have to report errors and what we do in python 310 is we just raise the last exception so you don't know what happened really you only know right. why the last attempt failed you don't even know how many attempts we made to connect to how many configurations did, did we try so um you know, that, that was a long-standing open problem, kind of, can we do better than just report the last error? And we closed it. We just added yeah, a parameter to that. So give nice. me a demo in a group. Another place that comes to mind is, uh, maybe you're all familiar with some of these retry libraries. Yeah. Like retry, but yeah, I think there's others as well, where you put a decorator onto uh, some function. You say, try this, you know, multiple times. And if it fails, do like some sort of, exponential back off because maybe the server's overloaded right Th those types of things would be really great like if it retries all the times it's supposed to and it fails it'd be good to get all the errors not just the last one or the first one or whatever it decided it was going to give you yeah yeah it's the yeah, kind cool. of thing exactly yeah nice hey well congratulations on getting that feature out that's that's great all right what Thank do we you. got next here uh, I think also related to this, I wanted to talk about uh, this PEP 678. Yes, that, that, you that was... Tell us about this one? Yeah, that, that, that's a very small, simple uh, feature that... Um, well, the, Zach Hatford Dodds wrote this PEP. He he was trying out exception groups. He was, he was the first kind of user, even before the PR was merged, he was trying it out. He, he was trying to uh, integrate it with the hypothesis library. So there you write a test and the library executes it many times with different inputs and you get failures in some of the inputs and you want to report all of them. So Zach had an exception group, uh, kind of an exception wrapper, kind of like Trio Multi-Error. He had his own version that he built in his library and he could associate each exception he attached to it, which input generated this this error which is very important you need to tell people <laughs> what the input was and what happened with it and and he couldn't do that 
with with uh, in in a convenient way with exception groups. So we added this um, for to base exception. This is not a group feature. It's any exception you can add uh, a strings. Uh, you call add note, give it a string, and you can call it as many times as you want, and and add notes to the exceptions, and and they will appear in the trace back in the default trace back that the interpreter prints. So that's all it is. It's a very simple feature, but um, it. It, it it was received surprisingly well. People kind of like it, that, that you can enrich an exception after you catch it. So you have the information that, that you know, the error message and the type, you, you decide that when you raise the exception. But then sometimes when you yeah. catch it, there's some more information, some context, like what was I trying to do when this error happened? Sure. Yeah, because often you'll see except some type, some exception type, you'll deal with what you can, but you can't really handle it there. So you got to raise it again. And this is a, a place to add more information without completely wrapping it, right? Right, exactly. A lot of people yeah. you have to chain it, say this raised from that. So there will be situations where maybe you won't need to do that. Yeah, I'd love to see that go away. I I'm sort of template libraries and stuff in the web all the time. I see like, there's all these different errors, and you got to hunt through bunch of stuff to figure out what happened yeah but also think about for instance um like i think this is super useful actually for end users even like you think about that you're doing some query query, ah, query to the database right and then yeah. i don't know it may fail for six million reasons and then you want to add w what were you asking for right so you add your your query or your user or whatever because probably the yeah. exception that the um postgres thingy that is underneath is not going to contain your actual thing so so this actually may save you hours right because in many enterprise environments you don't even have easy access to dev so so you, sorry to prod so so you you don't, you mm -hmm. cannot just go there and see what's going on so so it would be super cool that you say or oh, if something fails you know i was trying to do this with this data and like with these things and like exactly. if it fails now you can know what's going on and you don't even need to log in which is yeah I think that's it's a, a great idea cool. yeah yeah it's it's a great idea or if you know, look, here's probably why this happened. As a library developer, you're like, look, this is the error, but here's a note. Look, this is probably because you didn't initialize the connection before you called this. So make sure, you know, like that. Uh, another er uh, area where I see this could be useful is um, I want to raise, like the example you have in the docs is type error, but it could also, you know, it could be value error or some other built in low level type. And you're like, really, this is just, I want to raise that error but it doesn't have a place for me to put additional information. And so I want to kind of enrich that with more. And so not just catch, add the data and then raise it again, but actually I want to use a base error type that doesn't let me put more details in it and then just raise that, right? That would also work? I, I think so. I mean, I think the intention was, uh, there was some discussions about uh, using notes in the interpreter and I pushed back on it because I said, this, this is owned by the application. The interpreter yeah. shouldn't touch the notes, you know, because people can wipe out the notes. They can change the order. They can do what they want. It's 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 the applications, uh, at least the way I see yeah. it. Application owns it. You you put whatever context you want to put. Um, Is there only one note? When I say add note, does that set the note, or can I have a <laughs> list of notes? <laughs> it's a list of notes. Um, okay, got it. Yeah, and you can wipe it out if you want. You can. It, it's a, It's just a list. It's attached to the yeah. exception. You can do what you want with it. Really? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a great, it's a really great feature. I mean, it's, I'm sure it was way less work than except star, but it's also going to be really valuable, I think. Yes, it, 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 it's, it's very simple, but it's, um, yeah. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Brent or Mark, you guys got any thought about this before we move on to the next? I think it's really cool. I, I like it. Great work, Gary. Yeah. Indeed, uh, I think it is as well. Actually, I'm really excited about it. Uh, let's let's go. I'm talk about let's let's talk about faster Python for a little bit. So, Mark, I had you and Guido on back on, uh, wow, almost to the day a year ago. Uh, we're off by November first, 2021. So, <laughs> quite not uh, not that long ago, but yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about the work that you're doing there. Um, I guess the headline is that Python 3.11 is 
10 to 60, 10 to 50 percent faster than previous, sort of on a reasonable range of applications. Is that the story? Yeah, it's somewhere between minus a few percent and plus a hundred, but it, it varies a huge amount. I mean, sure. So, I mean, if you've got some application that basically spends all its time in NumPy or something like that, you're not really going to speed up at all. But if it's pure Python, you'd expect it to be a you know, good 40, 50 percent faster. So, but it depends. Right. That's a good point because a lot of people do make Python faster by writing C or Rust or other languages. And at that point, like, it's out of your hands, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. we're, you know, looking hopefully for 3.12 to start looking at the sort of interface between Python and C code. So we should speed up code even there is quite a lot of C code. We won't spend up the time spent in the C code, in doing the actual work in the C code, but there's still quite mm -hmm. a lot of sort of marshalling of data that happens, and hopefully we'll streamline that. But, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, the existence of C extensions is sort of in some ways limits our opportunity to speed things up, but it's also, you know, why Python is so popular in the first place or one of the main reasons. So definitely need to acknowledge yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. So Brent, I'll definitely have you talk about the specializing interpreters, but Mark, maybe give us a rundown of some of the things from your plan that made it in in here i know some were aimed for 310 but they didn't make it until here, uh right? yeah so the whole thing oh that that original plan i put up that was more of a just uh you know get this discussion get the discussion going sort of thing and it's basically yeah. it's more or less a year off so if you just shift everything one forward i mean there was a lot of discussion on you know speeding up the interpreter in the first iteration and then looking more to sort of data structures in the second thing is is much more jumbled than that. We're doing sort of a bit of everything. So obviously with, uh, well, I was planning on, you know, expecting a smaller team. So things are being a bit shuffled. So yeah, there's this mm -hmm. uh, specializing interpreter. Obviously that's kind of key. But there's also quite a lot of stuff we've done with data structures. I mean, we shrunk the Python object. So we've been, I mean, the Python object, you know, has been shrinking for years. I mean, I've, I've got some numbers here, so like in two seven and three two, a, a like an object with just four attributes would take three hundred and fifty two bytes on a sixty four bit machine, and for three eleven we've got it down to one hundred and twelve, and for three twelve wow. it'll be ninety six. Well, before you get too excited, there's only thirty two in C plus plus, so you know we've got a bit of way to go. But yeah, but uh, you know it's going in the right direction for oh, yeah, sure. And, you know. I'm sure some people out there listening just say like, okay, well, it's half the size roughly and it's going to be less than that. So, yay, we can use less memory. But maybe you could talk a little bit about how that affects things like, you know, L1, L2, L3 cache hits and other sort of – like it. it's more important than just I need less RAM, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's a two two things that happen. There's Yeah, there's things are faster because the hardware is just happier. If you pack everything together, it's in a high-level cache. So you're not getting these sort of long pauses as, as you hit main memory. Um, and the other thing is just the data structures are, because there's less of them, there's less indirection. So uh, for example, to load an attribute, we can, we've got it down for basically an old, you know, older versions of Python. It was sort of effectively five memory reads and they were dependent memory reads. You have to read one before the next one and so on. And right, right. Quite, go to quite the class, stuff. find it, go to the object, find its dictionary, <laughs> yeah, yeah. find the pointer that's in the dictionary and then go to that, right? Like it's... Yeah, yeah, they're, they're very much that. And that's yeah. down to more or less two now, so... Okay. Uh, that, that's I mean, awesome. obviously, there's still interpretive overhead on that, so that this it's not quite that much faster, but it's getting there, so... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's the data structures and then the, the frames, the Python frames. Every time you call a Python function, uh, we used to just allocate a heap object for the frame and all the stuff would go in there. Um, and now they're all basically in a big contiguous sort of block of memory. So it's just bumping a pointer rather than allocating, which is also mm -hmm. faster. Um, and frames are just smaller anyway because of the, the, oh, the zero cost exceptions, which I think we... Also, we mentioned on the uh, the release thing, but uh, yeah. yeah, this is yeah. Well, let's tell people about zero cost exceptions. Okay, well, zero cost. You shouldn't have to pay for errors if you're not raising errors, right? Yeah, well, that's the idea, and that's why they're called zero cost. But zero cost is in quotes in this, uh, and the reason for that is it's just that's the name it has got. They're definitely not zero cost. The idea is that they're pretty low cost if you don't have an exception, but they tend to be even more expensive if you do get an exception because you have to do more lookup. 
But the, the, the important thing here is that just there was lots of runtime information we need to maintain and we don't now. So that again shrinks the frames and just makes calls faster because calls in Python were notoriously slow. So that's a, one thing we've sped up significantly. Yeah, so the idea was in previous releases of Python, if you just to enter a try block, even if it was successful, there was a little bit of overhead to set up the mechanisms of potentially handling the errors and the information you needed, right? And, yeah, um, and that, this wasn't you just the overhead. more of that, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's actually not so much that overhead as the just the space you had to put that data in had to be allocated every time you made a call in case there was an exception. And then we had to, it was massively alloc over allocated to the amount of space that anyone ever needed. So just yeah, that, that was the big sort of advantage. Nice. Yeah, I, this is fantastic. You don't want to discourage people from putting proper air, line, air handling in their code. Yeah, <laughs> Harit, what do you think? I, I see your name on this feature here in GitHub. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, no, I, I yeah, I think I think it's it's cool. I mean, I was kind of, um, you know, it, it 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 was a nice touch that Mark implemented it between when I wrote the prototype for exception groups and when the perf was approved. So <laughs> that um, got in the way a little bit, but it was, it was good. It was I I I got intimately acquainted with zero cost exceptions through that exercise. Of well, updating. it's zero cost for 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 some people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, the, the, I, I tease Mark a lot about that, but um, yeah. Um, no, I, I think it's a cool feature, and I, I mean, I, I followed up on that. Uh, we now have um, after we removed that, we still had a. I was talking about this on Monday. We had a jump over the exception handler, and then I told Mark, "Wait a minute, there's, there's a jump. It's not zero. You have to jump over the exception handler if there's no exception." So, so now we have, uh, we did, um, uh, we identify exception handlers as cold blocks. And, and before we lay out the code of the function, we put all the cold blocks in the end. So now if there's no exception, it, there isn't even an exception handler to jump over. That will be in 3.12. Yeah. So. Excellent. Yeah, this you is- You made zero good. cost even faster. So now it's- I mean, like, I mean, yeah, zero even cost. smaller, yeah. Um, <laughs> It's asymptotically approaching zero. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it's kind of nice that we have this uh, notion of cold blocks and hot blocks, and we can maybe do other things with it. it, it, it it's kind of nice that all the all the happy the, the fast uh, code is is kind of in the beginning of the functions bytecode block, and mm -hmm. it, you know, in terms of caches and all that, you don't have to. It, I think it will it will bring a few benefits beyond just not having to jump. Yeah, yeah, this is excellent. Uh, it's a really great feature, and pretty straightforward. All right, let's, uh, Brent, tell us about uh, the specializing adaptive interpreter. That's a, a big deal. You and I spoke about that about six weeks ago, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, the headline is the the bytecode changes while it's running to adapt to your code, um, which is really neat. So it's it's kind of um, finding places where we can do the same thing, but using less work by like cheating a little bit, <laughs> but cheating in yeah. a way that is not visible at all. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a good example is uh, something like a, a global load or a, a, a load from the built-in. So if I'm looking at like the len function, um, you know, that requires two dictionary lookups. Every time I want to look at the len function anywhere, I first need to check the global namespace and that's going to be a failed lookup. Then I need to check the built-ins dictionary, and that's going to be a successful lookup. So every time I want to use len or range or list or any of those built-ins, uh, that's the cost that I have to pay. But people don't change the global namespace that often, and people change the built-ins namespace even less often, or at least they shouldn't be changing yeah. it very often. <laughs> um, I'm going to make false so, true and true false. Let's see what that does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and so... Uh, and so, you know, you can you can make these observations where it's like, okay, well, if the set of keys in the global namespace hasn't changed since last time this bytecode instruction ran, then I know that that lookup's going to fail because if it failed last time and the keys are the same, then it's going to fail this time as well. So we can just skip that. Um, and same for uh, the built-ins dictionary. You know, if if we know that the the 
keys in that dictionary haven't changed. Um, that actually means that the internal layout of the dictionary is the same, and we don't even need to look up len in the built-ins dictionary. We can reach directly to the last location where it was before and uh, give you that instead. And so oh, you cool. often see in a lot of uh, code as like a, a older code as a, a kind of a micro optimization. Um, whenever someone was using a built-in in like a very hot Python loop, sometimes you'd see them like uh, do this kind of quark trick where they make it a local variable by saying like len equals len or something like that as part of the function's arguments um, so that you turn it into a, a fast local load. And what we've essentially done is, uh, you know, made ugly hacks like that uh, totally unnecessary. Uh, which yeah, is really you do that behind the scenes transparently, yeah. Exactly. And so that's that's just, you know, one example, we've, we've done tons of specializations for all sorts of things, ranging from calls to attribute lookups, to attribute stores, et cetera. So um, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really powerful thing that um, it, the PEP was, uh, what was it, it's the five, six, nine, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, Mark wrote it. It was six, five, nine. Six, five, nine, yeah. almost there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, this interpreter is Mark's baby. He could, he could tell you much more about it than I could, but nice. I, I do I, want I like to give you a chance to give it. Yeah. I just want to give you a chance to give a shout out about specialist. Yeah. Yeah. So this is why I was on your show a couple of weeks ago. Um, so looking at bytecode disassemblies is not fun. Um, and so, um, I, one thing that's kind of cool is, you know, if you, if you upgrade to Python 3.11, you run your code and you saw it got, you know, 10, 20, 30% faster. You might be wondering, like, okay, where did it get faster? Like, what is faster about my code? Um, and so, um, specialist is basically a, a package that I made. It's pip installable. It only works on three eleven. And basically, if you run your code using specialist instead of Python, um, so you just type specialist my project .py or whatever, um, it will open a web browser and uh, show you your code, but color highlighted to show you where the interpreter was able to specialize your code where it wasn't. Um, and that's really neat. So you can see like, oh, actually, you know, the, these are the attribute loads that got faster. These are the places where my global loads are being cached. Um, that's really yeah. Neat. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, this is a really cool project. And it has uh, some proactive features, not just informational aspects, I think anyway. You know, if you run a profiler, it'll show you where your code's spending time. But it, it doesn't mean you should go change everything to make it faster. You should look at like, oh, well, this loop or this one function is like the thing that maybe we should think about slightly changing the algorithm or the way we do a loop or something. And it's a little bit similar here because the specializing adaptive interpreter only specializes some things like uh, it doesn't specialize floats interacting with ints uh, or those types of things. Uh, or I think division as well. And so there's certain ways you might be able to slightly change inside of a really hot loop, you know, make something to float ahead of time if you know it's going to be involved in floating point operations, right? I think, the, yeah, the idea is that this is show us how we can fix things so that you don't need to mess with your code. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I see. So this is uh, in the future. Okay, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, go ahead, Pablo. I, I, would, I would not necessarily encourage people to start tuning individual bytecode instructions in their code. Right. Um, due to otherwise, you will end up going to see. <laughs> you but, mean I, is, I got to take all those decimal points back out of my code? No, just kidding. Yeah, I want to get every single bytecode instruction green. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it is, you know, it's, it, some things will never specialize, and that's just an artifact of, of programs. But, you know, if we can specialize enough, and we typically do, um, you yeah, know, cool. out of, you know, one line, maybe 20 bytecode instructions, if, uh, you know, four of them get specialized successfully and two of them don't, generally, that will still be fast. Brian, do you know um, what you should do for April Fool? Like, you should do a Python plugin the colors that shows you the percentage of specialized instructions in your code, and people can fix the percentage so they can say, "Fail my test suite if my code is not specialized more than fifty percent." <laughs> right. If if you despecialize it, it's exactly. like a performance regression. So just don't say anything. Yeah. Drop it. Yeah, I, well, I, yeah, it's like a coverage thing. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I was, yeah, I was exactly. kind of thinking about this. So <laughs> Pablo could tell you more about this, but his his cool new uh, tracebacks. Uh, the whole reason specialist is able to do these these cool uh, you know, column level highlighting of your source code is because we do have that fine grained position information under the hood. So it's 
we kind of just piggybacked on that feature in order to give you that. But I, I was kind of thinking an, another another thing, another April Fool's project could be, uh, you know, like column level coverage information. So to get to 100% coverage, you have to cover every single column in your code. Exactly. But yeah. I, I feel like people might take that too seriously. Even the white space, all this white space is not covered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You think you're intense by having branch coverage turned on? Just wait till you have column coverage turned on. Yeah, you can only cover two white spaces per line, so you got to call that a lot. All right, I think that's a perfect segue over to uh, one of the most tangible contributions uh, from Pablo here. Uh, maybe tell us about this new um, fine grained error locations and tracebacks. This, this is fantastic. This will save people being in debuggers or rewriting their code with tons of print statements to figure out what's going on, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we put a lot of effort into this. Um, so this is, uh, um, man, I don't even remember my pep, so I don't know. It's pep something, something, and it has a horrendous name. Six, as six I five, say. seven, and let's see. Six, five, seven, thanks. Uh, and, uh, include yeah, fine-grained yeah, yeah. error locations and tracebacks. Yeah, this the, the, the worst name. Uh, even I think I, I was talking with Mark in the Python Core developer sprint, and he was saying, like, what it means, like, fine grain. Like, <laughs> like you know, like, is this very fine grain? Like, so I think we are renaming the pep to fancy tracebacks. I, I think that's much better. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is a project I worked together with uh, Batuhan Taskaya and Omar Askar. So kudos to them as well, because they participated equally on this. And the idea is that... Um, uh, we we were like we started this project to make um, you know to improve the error messages in the interpreter and the general experience um, not only for you know people because when people talk about this they normally refer to you know people starting to learn Python but like to be honest most of these things also affect people that are expert like uh, you know my, I always say that when I implemented the suggestions. I was the first one benefiting from them because like I make a lot of typos and, and you know, like it says, oh, did you mean this? So so the idea that we had is that oh, um, most of the time, uh, the lack of, uh, you know, the, the, the interpreter shows you kind of the, the, the position when the error happens, but it's quite limited because um, most of the time you people tend to have uh, due to Python flexible syntax, a, a huge amount of like complexity, even in a single line. Uh, you know, in the pep, there is a bunch of examples like you access a bunch of keys in a dictionary and some of them doesn't work or is not there or is none or something like that. Right. And then it fails. And uh, or sometimes you have like several function calls or several additions. Um, and, you know, it, it's quite difficult. And most of the time fixing these things involve going into a debugger like PDB and then trying to inspect every single object and say, okay, this dictionary doesn't have this key at this level. And like, you know, that, that, that sucks. It like, it's not good yeah. because like the buggers are cool, but like it's cooler not to use them. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, we thought, what can we do here? And we, we arrived to this idea actually also to mention, uh, everyone involved. This was originally inspired by some kind of, prototype that Carl from the PyPy team made very long ago um, when he saw like a kind of minimal version of this. And then I said, okay, can we do this? And what, what we do now is that um, we propagate, because the parser, uh, our super cool pack parser, uh, knows uh, the position of all the tokens and things like that. So we are propagating those that information through the interpreter. And we store this information now in code objects. So a side effect of this pep actually is that code objects are slightly bigger. Uh, although, you know, because code objects don't tend to be a huge percentage of your application, it doesn't really matter that much. Maybe PYC files are a bit bigger, but, you know, you have a lot of disk, disk space, I'm sure. And, and the idea is that, um, uh, you know, we, we store this information in code objects. So when you raise an exception, we, we say, well, what is the instruction that is uh, raised this exception? And then once we know, which is the instruction that raised the exception, then we go and say, okay, what is the position uh, information that generated this instruction? And because we propagated it, we know. And then we can say, okay, here, here is kind of like the like the lines, uh, the columns that this, uh, this instruction spans. So that kind of allows us to underline the specific location. Yeah, but we go it's... a bit further. Uh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Michael. I was going to say, this is super valuable. Uh, the example you have in the PEP is, you have a dictionary and you say bracket of key A, and then the thing that comes back is another dictionary. So you say bracket B and then another dictionary, bracket C right. and then bracket D. And if the, you know, in 310, the error is just like, 
if one of those is miss is is none say none type is object object is not subscriptable or maybe you know does not contain that key or some weird thing like that but is it a b c or d you have no idea you're in a debugger printing them out separately or something but now it just right. goes nope it's the c one that's it's the third exactly. uh, subscript one and that's just just jump yeah right also to this oh, error okay. non type is not subscriptable it's kind of like <laughs> thanks for the info <laughs> like it's like you know water is wet okay thanks uh, it's not, it's not exactly. super useful. No, exactly. So then everyone is going to rain. Anyway, like, and and the, well, we we did like the first version of this, and then we realized realized um, that there was some kind of like you know it was cool. Like most people really like it, but like especially for instance with the example with the dictionary that has many dictionaries inside, there was some confusion because like you know it underlines the whole thing, and then. You know the order of operations, and you know uh, also with complex mathematical expressions like you do a plus b plus c, and the last addition fails. It it needs to underlie a plus b plus c because what happened is that it first added a plus b, and that gives you something right. that then you add it to c. And what happened is that the last addition failed, but that includes a plus b, so you need to underline the whole thing. If you know the order of operations, then if I just underline a plus b plus c, you know that what ha what will fail is the last one because that's the last one that is executed. But is it still confusing because, you know, specifically also with the dictionary, people were saying, yeah, okay, but like you're underlying like three keys here, which is the one that failed. I mean, you know, you can learn by experience that is the last one, but it's kind of like, it was not a great experience. So we went a, a step further. So what we do is that once we know the, the kind of range in the line that shows the, the problem, we reparse that uh, chunk of expression and then we know okay so we know now that this expression has this AST and then we analyze the AST and then we say okay is this AST something that we can further uh, you know uh, improve the error message like for instance is this AST a bunch of key access in a dictionary or a bunch of attribute access or a bunch of uh, function calls or, or, or maybe binary operations and if it's the case then we use a specialized um, like you know, underline, I don't know, tildes or uh, squiggles or yeah, whatever yeah, it's yeah. called. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the dictionary ones have this this different one that marks which key access it was known, the same thing for binary operations and things like that. Um, so so we, we do this extra step at the end that, you know, does a bunch of extra work, but um, it, it tries to improve even upon the kind of under, just underlying the line just so we can uh, uh -huh. offer even more rich information. And um, I'm, I'm quite happy. I'm, I'm very pleased about this. Um, I <laughs> sorry, Mark, but I think it's the best feature of 3.11. <laughs> um, yeah, this is probably the second stream when when I said this, but uh, it's true, um, totally, totally true, one hundred percent true. So, so I don't know. I'm very excited about this. Uh, I literally use this every day. I today I was deploying Python 3.11. Well, uh, this week, sorry, I was deploying Python 3.11 at Bloomberg, and something went wrong, and literally this thing saved my day. This saved me to just logging into some forsaken machine and understanding what's going on. What about that? Um, so super cool. Very happy. I hope that everybody yeah. that uses this and is happy reach to us and say, I am happy because like normally people reach to us when they are not happy. And they say, mm, evil core developers, you break everything. But instead of that, you should reach to us and say, nice. I did this, uh, you, yeah, you know, I, I this cool thing. or something though. Don't, don't open issues saying you're happy. Exactly. Exactly. Just, <laughs> just, just exactly. Just tweet a couple tildes, a few carrots, and a smiley face at him. Exactly. Tweet a happy at Python dot org. I will, I will take that <laughs> yeah. and <the> email address. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, is that we improve it a bit further. One of the things that happen is that. Um, you know, like sometimes if the whole line is wrong, because for instance, this this example that you have there, if you uh, sorry for the ones listening, what I had before, yep. We have we have here some some we are seeing some output, but doesn't matter. Don't worry, I will describe it. So, for instance, um, if, if you're if you're calling a function and that's the whole thing that is in the line, we used to under like underline the whole thing. So we'll say okay, even if the the whole line is failing, so it's not like a part of the line is failing. The whole thing is failing. We used to underline that, and that apparently is still on the pep. Uh, maybe i should change that because that is not like that anymore because someone suggested i mean come on like if it's the whole line is failing underlying the whole line is actually not that useful and you know you are you are spending vertical space so you need to scroll a lot and at the beginning i say yeah but it's, it's inconsistent i don't like it and uh, i push back a bit but like then you know more people say pablo you're wrong and then i say okay okay i'm wrong 
and uh, we 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 <laughs> we improve this further. Um, so you say, but don't take this as a as an advice. Don't tell me that I'm wrong <laughs> collectively, please. Um, but uh, right. So so now, if uh, if the whole line is underlined, we don't underline it because that, it doesn't really add any new information, right? So so only if a part of the line is is uh, contains the error, not the whole line. Um, so this means that we are not going to you know consume a lot of vertical space for no reason. And the last thing I wanted to say is that you know there is some people somewhere in the universe that may care about that extra disk space on their PYC files, or they just really really hate squiggles. Um, I don't know if that is even physically possible, but you know there is very <laughs> different and diverse set of people. And so if you if you are one of those, uh, there is a collection of different ways you can deactivate this feature. Um, there is an environment variable with a super long name. Uh, and there is a minus X option when you launch the interpreter. So you can say Python minus X something something. I don't know how it's called. I think it's called no debug ranges. Um, what about that? What that incredible naming. <laughs> Um, and then you, you set no debug ranges to one and it deactivates the feature, incredible, like magic, it's gone. And uh, you can reclaim your PYC files and you can even generate PYC files without this information if when you're compiling uh, PYC files you set this evil uh, environment variable. But don't do that, uh, listeners, don't do that, it's evil, don't do that, just, just use it, it's, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's another um, kind of type of, of errors that I think we're going to get is about edge cases where the compiler doesn't get the line numbers right because uh, all these kind of fine grained locations, it's all new. And, you know, we're still adding from out. Future, there is a from future, I think, that you put like a bunch of things with the from future, it just complains on a random place. Yeah, that today today I found yeah. that one. But yeah, I, I've been looking at the compiler and, and, and line numbers, location information, and it's a bit off here and there. And we, we have received um, bug reports from other people as well. Like the range yeah. here doesn't look right. The range here looks too, yeah. warped, too broad. Or, so, yeah, we're going to get, we're going to be, ironing that out for, I guess, for 3.12. Yeah, right. it's really nice when people are using betas and release candidates, though, because we were able to catch a lot of those before the release, because there, there were a couple people, I forget exactly the name of the project, but they're working on like a code animation tool where it animates your code while it's running. Um, and they were using these new ranges to identify AST nodes and stuff. And so they they did this thing, I guess, where they like run their tool in the entire standard library, make sure it's correct. And so we got a bunch of bug reports that basically say, oh, you know, this column information is off for this weird multi-line attribute access or something. Um, if so, you recall, yeah, you can... I think you fix an error that was super weird because it was like a method access, like, you know, yeah. uh, my instance of yeah. And if the method access has like some like vowel or something like that, it, it, it was wrong. And if you added some extra letter, it was, it was fine. And that was yeah, it was like if you if you split your method access across two lines, if you do like x dot method or x dot method or x dot method on, right. on three lines right, or two right, lines right. or something, the way we trace those lines, we always trace the method when we're actually loading the method, even if it's on a different line as like where the actual method load started. And then we were doing some weird math to like figure out where the dot is. So we would try to put it on the same line as the dot. Yeah, that, that was So we just insane. like subtract one from the length of the name. And so there's all sorts of crazy stuff. That, and that came from wow. the grave wow. because we, we fixed that. And then it was it was wrong again because like we were like miscalculating the name. It's just so man, yeah. that easy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so all sorts of fun stuff like that. Yeah, amazing. Well, yeah, this is a, definitely one of the highlight features um, for sure, and also the performance work that you're all doing. All right, we're 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 getting very, very short on time, so I think maybe a uh, super, super lightning round here. Let me just um, say we also got Tomalib support built in. We've got the async IO task groups a, a la um, Trio Nurseries. We've got uh, new features for atomic grouping and regular expressions. Uh, let's see, a self-type, a lot of type things have been added. So we got the self-type, variatric generics, uh, literal strings, which is very interesting. Lucas did a talk about that on the, the release live stream. Stuff for type dict and data class transformations. So uh, great stuff. Now, uh, let's just really quickly round out. Uh, what's the Python 3.11 story for high script, Is there 
Do you know? Have any anyone out there know? I, I don't know. I suppose it works. Tier two or tier three supported platform, right? Yeah. yeah so Christian Himes uh, is the unsung hero of uh, TypeScript. Uh, sorry, TypeScript. Uh, sorry, uh, is the unsung hero of uh, X. X uh, well, whatever, like the WASI thing. So it's the the web assembly. That's it. Sorry, uh, I say all the all the things that were not that. So he has been making a lot of improvements to the build process, which you know is not easy. So so kudos to Christian Himes. If you're listening, you're great. And um, I suppose mm -hmm. that a Py, uh, Py, Py script can um, with through Pyolite. This is how many layers is this? So, so <laughs> Pyolite through <laughs> these can leverage all these improvements because I don't know how this the whole layer tower thing is working, but but Pyolite has a bunch of patches that you know you need to modify C Python so it builds nicely on, right. on WebAssembly platforms. I don't know the details on that. I just know that some of them are okay, -ish, some of them are not okay and quite difficult to maintain. And Christian Heinz has been making a lot of great effort to you know change here and there and like put a lot of macros and if devs and things like that. So so C Python kind of builds easier. Uh, this probably translates that Biolite, I hope uh, um, kind of you know can can consume this build in an easier way with less patches and i suppose that translates into PyScript, like just you know using the pilot thing easily but um but yeah i don't think that there is a huge amount of improvements more than you know we are working towards official support as brand was mentioning yeah we have this yeah, new tier yeah. system it's super cool and as like a <laughs> just unrelated fun fact, Mike Dropu, one of the early uh, developers of Pyodide, is actually managing our team at Microsoft. So. Oh, well. yeah. uh, it's funny how the circle comes back around. Yeah. Indeed, how the cool. darn tables. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, y'all. We are uh, out of time, but super exciting. I uh, wish we had some champagne. And Pablo, we didn't even bring hats to celebrate Python 3.11. Oh. But I know everyone out but there is people, extremely excited. People cannot see it, but I have a Python 3.11. Yes, yeah. It's a great nice. new logo for 3.11 and stuff. Not for yeah. in general, but just for the release. It's awesome. All right. Before we get out of here, let me just ask you one final question, and then we'll we'll call it a show. Um, notable PyPI package, something you want to give a shout out to. We'll go top to bottom in the picture here. Pablo? Notable by my package. Well, yeah, I'm yeah, going to drop a bunch of spam, and I'm going to say memory. <laughs> Use memory, uh, the one and only Python memory profiler. Yeah, solve your yeah, problems cool. on production today uh, with memory. That and the underlying errors, you'll be all good. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Right. What a combination. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Arit, how are you? Um, well, I, I've had some interaction with the author of Bytecode recently because I was looking at things. Um, to do in, 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 in the testing in, in the interpreter that are kind of like that. So this is a library you can kind of from Python write bytecode and and it oh, wow. it it's it's pretty neat. And it is struggling with zero cost exceptions, but eh, you know, it is what it is. It's like uh, inline oh, wow. assembly it's but for great. Python. <laughs> it, yeah, it's awesome. like from from a Python script you can kind of write a, a bit of bytecode and, and get it to, yeah. I don't know, do a lot of interesting yeah. stuff with it. That's awesome. Yeah. Brent, how about you? Well, I'm partial towards specialist, but if I had to choose something else, um, I, I speaking of speed, I, I really like the scaling profile, profiler. Um, I've been using it a lot of my own projects, and it, it's it's awesome. I, I don't know how it's memory profiling compares to memory. I'm sure memory is better, but uh, uh, scaling is really nice for uh, measuring the difference. The, performance uh, across both Python and C code, which is cool. Excellent. Mark? Well, it's not actually a PyPI package. I was going to say the Sys module, which is like yeah. pretty much right. the most fundamental module Come going. But there's all, sorts of, there's all sorts of fun things in there. You can change the recursion limit and see. You can muddle it. If you're interested in how Python works, it's actually quite a sort of fun thing to play with. So, Cool. Right on. All right. Well, thank you all for all the hard work. And I know there are many people who did a ton of work as well who are not on the show here, but no, you can represent them as well. So thanks all for being here. Um, final call to action. People want to get started with 3.11. You know, is, what do you tell them? Is, is it ready for them to get going? What do you think? It's awesome. Yeah, 
It's awesome. And also now 311 comes with a bunch of wheels for all your packages because there has been a, a lot of good work in the people of, uh, you know, third party libraries. And now that, you know, people are using CI build wheel, um, 311 was released with wheels for NumPy and Pandas and a bunch of other things that previously was failing massively because nobody could compile them on their crappy laptop. But now you don't need that. You can just download them and it works. So just use 311. There is no reason. Yeah, that's and excellent. just boring. That would be a reason. If you're boring and you don't want to use 311, then don't use it. You didn't break anything. Not even a package, much less GitHub. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and we need more benchmarks. <laughs> So well, yeah, that's, 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 that's how people can help us make things faster. It's more benchmarks. So, uh, yeah, we have a, there's a sort of standard Python performance suite, but it's kind of a bunch of toy programs and so on. So if you've got something that might make a nice sort of benchmark, you know, sort of some self-contained, but sort of realistic program, then yeah, let us know. All right, cool. Well, thanks again. Great work on it. Uh, Cam Gerlock out in the audience says, yay, see, I build wheel. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great stuff. So thanks again, everyone. I'm super Thank excited you, Michael, to start for using 311 us. myself. So yeah, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye.